here um, with this uh, autumnal air mass in place. And I say that as to give us a little bit of a segue to our speaker today, who's a colleague of mine from ECU Pirate Nation days and looking much, much sharper now in uh, uniform per se at the Citadel. Of course, I'm Tom Allen with ODU uh, Geography and ICAR. And uh, this is our second to last seminar for this fall semester. Uh, we have Dr. Scott Curtis, um, it's going to talk about compound coastal water hazards, uh, redefining or uh, refining concepts related to risk response and resilience. And Scott has a Bachelor of Arts from, uh, what's that place up the road, Scott? Uh, UVA, <laughs> sorry. Um, but uh, an excellent program in environmental sciences. And uh, he has a, a PhD from University of Wisconsin. And uh, we met at ECU uh, with kind of some intersecting interest in climate change, coastal hazards, and worked together there in geography planning and the Hazard Center for several years. Uh, at ECU, Scott was a distinguished professor and uh, you know, rose to full professor uh, working up with that program, uh, did extensive research on drought, uh, extreme precipitation events, working in East Carolina, working in uh, extensively and repeatedly on uh, human environment interactions and drought and uh, with the midsummer drought of the Caribbean and Jamaica. Uh, he has more recently moved to, as you can see, the Citadel. And he is a, in an endowed position there directing the James Near Center for Climate Studies. So uh, in the interest of kind of expanding um, our awareness, uh, what other universities and cities are doing. Uh, we invited Scott to uh, give us a perspective uh, from the South. So Scott, uh, we'll, we'll take it away. I um, also want uh, folks, you, you're welcome to uh, sort of plant some questions in the chat. We'll take, we'll have time at the end of the talk to uh, address those and we'll have a kind of hard stop at 4.30. Okay, thanks everyone for coming and take it away, Scott. All right, great. Uh, thanks, Tom. Thanks for the introduction. It's great seeing you again. Um, so yeah, as Tom said, uh, I've just been in this position for about a year and a half now. Uh, it's a new center that was endowed by one of uh, the Citadel's faculty members um, that uh, uh, wanted the center to happen, um, um, gave a nice, nice big uh, endowment for it. And, uh, and yeah, so this is, uh, I'm excited to, to be here and present uh, this research. Compound Coastal Water Hazards, Refining Concepts of Risk, Response, and Resiliency. Um, if you look at the, the, the sign there, there's lots of these signs all around our campus. And, at, and on the coast, we're right on the Ashley River, in case you don't know where the Citadel is located. So this is an example of a compound event, right? High tide and heavy rains, this area floods. So um, we have flooding sources you know, from, from different directions, and uh, we want to know better understand our risk and how to respond to these kind of floods. So um, this is a, um, really what I'm presenting is an overview of what we've done so far with this project, preparing for responding to and mitigating compound water hazards for resilient rural communities, which was funded in 2019. And I was just talking to, to, to Wei and, um, and uh, um, Josh, they're both from ODU, both funded on the same project, this COCOS ARP project. Um, and these are the uh, co-PIs and, uh, and also co-authors of this, of this presentation because I'm presenting some of their work here today. Uh, so we have Dr. Jamie Cruz, who uh, for, the, for a long time has, has headed the Center for Natural Hazards Research at ECU in economics. We have uh, Dr. Uh, Anurata Mukherjee, planning in, in ECU. Uh, Osmita Ghosh in economics, who's a health economist, uh, and Jennifer Helgeson, who's with the um, National Institute for Science and Technology, and uh, she's also an economist. And then we funded two students through this. Um, we have Kelly DePole, which I believe, I believe she's on the call. I saw her name there. Um, she's my current master's student. I'll be presenting some of her work. She's finishing up this semester, and she's actually defending her uh, thesis on Friday. So if anyone's interested in the nitty-gritty details of that part of the talk, you're welcome to attend that. 
I can give you the, the link information there. And then an undergraduate student helped out with some of the, the data analysis. So I'm gonna start with just a, a background of what is a compound hazard. Uh, and the, this Zeichler definition is, is pretty, pretty good, pretty well accepted that it's a combination of multiple drivers and or hazards that contributes to societal or environmental risk. And so uh, if we think about water hazards, there's really three to consider um, that we're calling the compound coastal water event. And that is um, fluvial flooding. So the flooding due to extreme rainfall, fluvial flooding, flooding due to um, river um, discharge and, and overtopping banks. And then um, tidal uh, flooding or storm surge flooding, the, the flooding that comes from the ocean. Okay, so all of these intersect, um, and there's been studies been, that have, have looked at them, especially in, co in combination of two of these, all right? So for example, one of the earlier studies is from Thomas Wall in 2015 that uh, identified the co-occurrence of extreme rainfall and surge for, for many um, East Coast hurricanes. And, and he also found that that's going to increase uh, over time with climate change. And then there's a, uh, Moftakari in 2017 examined using COPAL as a, a, a type of statistic that I'll, I'll talk more about later on that uh, combined uh, surge with uh, fluvial flooding, looking at the co-occurrence and the co-risk of that. So, um, but I think what hasn't been done really completely is a full treatment of all three of these uh, together, uh, which is impactful for many different areas around uh, the Eastern part of the United States, including Norfolk, but also other parts of the world. So um, these authors that kind of came up with this uh, further uh, created a, a typology uh, of different types of compound events. And so we have four here. Um, we have the precondition where weather driven or climate driven preconditions aggravate a hazard. Um, and so one a good example of that are saturated soils affecting flood severity. So Hurricane Floyd in East North Carolina is a, a perfect example of that. It wouldn't have been the event that it was if it wasn't for the fact that all the soils were saturated from, from Dennis that, we, that came across earlier. That kind of brings, you, brings me, I'll jump over to temporally compounding because that is another example of that, right? Where we have multiple events back to back, a succession of hazards leading to an impact. And um, for Eastern North Carolina in more recent times, we had Florence, uh, we had Matthew, we had Dorian. So there's been a, been a, a slate of, of storms that have uh, impacted this area. Multivariate, this is the typical way we think of compound hazards and that's how I defined it really originally in that last slide, multiple drivers leading to an impact. So fluvial, pluvial and tidal flooding. And then spatially compounding. Uh, hazards in multiple connected locations causing an aggr aggregated impact. And so um, just a little bit more information on this one because I'm gonna kind of go into a little more detail on this particular type of compound hazard. But spatially compounded events can restrict emergency response, for example, uh, if their operational space, their jurisdiction experiences coincidental hazards. And also this has been studied recently in literature uh, in terms of extreme rainfall, uh, fluvial flooding, and now a storm surge, the recent study that, uh, this, that our team produced. Um, uh, and we'll, we'll talk more about that. Another thing I'd like to, to kind of define is, is the idea of socio-hydrology. The fact that we can't do this alone as hydrologists or climate scientists that we need Really, I know the words used a lot, but that transdisciplinary approach that we need multiple people coming together and, and really understanding each other's perspectives. Um, so to better understand and account for the joint distribution of physical drivers and societal mechanisms, because a lot of this compounding really gets at societal effects. So economics and health in particular, the two things that we've mostly studied so far in our, in our project. But you know, we need to bring together engineers, hydrologists, climate scientists, water agencies. And so this idea of socio-hydrology, um, kind of trying to bring in all of these different actors to, to, to talk about the, these problems. And that's, that is the idea of this project. Um, 
And the IPCC, uh, as many of you know, just released the physical science basis summary and uh, uh, 2021 in draft form. And, and one of the chapters in the, the, um, the physical science basis, volume one, is on compound hazards. It's, act, it's actually a new thing this, this time around. Um, and a couple of quotes out of this that I wanted to highlight is first of all, the global scale, and this is actually from a paper from uh, Bavaca at all 2020, but at the global scale and under high emission scenarios, the occurrence probability of meteorological conditions driving compound flooding would increase by more than 25% on average along coastlines worldwide by 2100 compared to the present. And uh, this is their summary statement in the IPCC chapter. There's a medium confidence. So it's not a high confidence right now. You know, this is not at that level. There's a lot of uncertainty about this, but there's a medium confidence that the occurrence and magnitude of compound flooding in coastal regions will increase in the future due to both sea level rise and increases in heavy precipitation. So again, going back to that sign, right? Uh, cases of uh, high tide or heavy rainfall, this area floods. Those, these are the two things that are gonna, they're gonna continue to be a problem going forward. So the objectives of our study were threefold. First of all, to assess the perceived flood risk and needs of the hazard management community in Eastern North Carolina through two-way communication. So we needed to have a workshop to bring every, all the parties together to talk about the issues. But secondly, to examine the physical nature and economic and health impacts of compound coastal water events. And from 2010 to present, we, we chose that because of some of the health data we were able to collect. We were looking at more recent events and also thinking about memory of people in, employed in the, in the hazard, you know, hazard professionals, uh, what, what they can uh, kind of think about. And then the, the last objective, which is what we're, we're gonna do now in this final year of the project, is to use that information to co-produce knowledge and tools for better preparation, response and mitigation plans. And so we'll talk about that last one uh, at the end of the talk. But first I wanna focus on objective one, uh, we are very fortunate to have a, a successful compound flooding workshop uh, at the end of February 2020. And as many of you know, this was at the very tail end of, of the good years before COVID hit. Um, and so we were really fortunate to get this out. And uh, we had 41 attendees, planners, emergency managers, and elected officials and, and others that attended. We had seven uh, focus group tables in the morning and seven in the afternoons for a total of 14 discussions. And we split that up by both geography and profession. So um, the kind of the, the framework was to, again, go through those, those questions of what is, what is important to you in terms of compound flooding? What are you, how are you thinking about it? How are you dealing with it? Uh, are you seeing changes? And what are sort of the economic and, and health uh, concerns that you might have? And so we had these, um, you know, we recorded all the conversations and we also had these flip charts, which we were kind of, able to jot down notes and kind of compare table to table sort of in real time during this workshop. So um, before the workshop, we were able to, to gather a little bit of quantitative information through a pre-focus group survey. Uh, and this was uh, about half of the participants. So we didn't, it was not a huge sample. It was about, I think about 20-ish uh, folks that filled this out. But there are some really interesting things that helped guide the discussion um, at the workshop. First of all, in terms of the three drivers of compound has, uh, flood hazards, you know, the CCWEs, we have rain, river, and ocean. Rain was seen as, as being really the most frequent, you know, the, the, the pluvial flooding. And, um, and in fact, 97% saw this type of flooding as becoming more frequent. So it, it outshone both, um, fluvial and tidal flooding in terms of the, the frequency, what they're seeing is in terms of frequency. In terms of like surprise and how and whether they expected it or not, um, again, rain stood out as being surprising. Uh, most or all the 29% said most or all the time uh, these, these rain flood events are surprising. And that's, it's not too surprising to think that might be the case considering we don't have a hazard map for rainfall, right? It's much easier to kind of know when we're gonna be, you know, when the, when the river, the floodplain of the river is going to be um, overtopped or, or, you know, what the storm surge zones are. So this is something that, you know, we know this is a problem essentially. 
Uh, and again, this is seen as becoming more surprising uh, in the, in, over the past um, 10 years. And then flood damages. Um, this, were, this one now river and ocean um, were more important. Okay, so uh, flooding from uh, river sources, flooding from uh, storm surge and other things were, were seen as more damaging than rainfall flooding. However, again, in terms of trends, rainfall was the top. Okay, 50% saw this type of flooding as becoming more damaging than river and ocean. So I think all this was really telling and um, kind of was a uh, kind of exciting way to start the, the, the workshop. But for um, <clears throat> the, the next thing that happened was um, members of the team took the, took the, uh, the recordings and transcribed them and took the, the flip charts and, 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 and wrote down the key, key phrases and came up with some, um, you know, some basic uh, structure uh, for the discussion, um, uh, some, some kind of content analysis for the discussion. And so this, this was broken down into, into these main um, categories, uh, flood preparation. So this, this kind of gives you a sense of what was talked about at the tables um, or the bigger categories, flood preparation, flood causes, solutions, planning and policies, network and communication, judicial responsibility, infrastructure impacts, flood response, and then flood recovery. So we kind of covered a, a, a pretty wide area there. And going back to that typology of compound hazards, what I did was kind of go through some of the, some of the quotes to try to see if the, that was up there in their, in their minds, the, these different types of compound uh, uh, hazards. So one is, um, the first one is multivariate. Multivariate came across, and of course that was the point, really the main point of the, of the, of the project too, um, with a quote of over nine inches of rain, we know we're gonna have problems once the rain falls. They have issues with it getting to the river. And once it gets to the river, then the river swells. And then if we're in the middle of a hurricane and we've got coastal surge going on, then a river can't flush it out. So all three of them really tie into what the issues are for everybody in the county. So there's other quotes there. That was, I didn't have any problem finding those. I just, I, that was a good one to, to use. However, there is very little discussion on spatial compounding, even though that's something I'm gonna talk a little bit more about today, but this is the only one I could find that really fit, fit into that category where it says, it's hard to know where's the hardest hit areas or where you need to go first. If there was some way of sorting that out a little better, then you could have a little more defined response to it, I guess. And there again, you don't know how or when a storm is going to hit you. So a lot of times you don't know. And there's a lot of that, a lot of that's the uncertainty. And then I, another thing that came out very strongly, and again, not surprising considering that this happened after Florence and after Matthew was the idea of temporal compounding. And here's two quotes, and again, there's many of them I could have chosen, uh, but the, here are two of them. I just think the frequency, the whole mental health, and seeing the look on these citizens' faces when, oh Lord, here it comes again, the day after, and they're trying to put their lives back together, their businesses back together. I mean, from businesses displaced to, of course, numerous households displaced, and just the compound effects of folks being out of their homes or folks getting back into their homes, like after Matthew, and then Florence hits. And so you kind of have a double whammy. So one of the studies we did, there was one other um, study that was very similar to this uh, published in literature, but we, we uh, wanted to look at a comparison of Matthew and Florence in terms of the flood extent. So we used, and again, using, we wanted to also look at parcel information because we wanted to bring the economics into this. Um, but what we did was I'm part of the um, First Street Flood Lab. ECU is a, is a member, and I think ODU might be a member as well, but um, we have access uh, to an API to, to download data, and it is multiple sources of flood water. So they look at, they use a model and they, and they use um, observational information um, uh, from satellites, I believe, and also from ground uh, uh, high water marks and other ground um, observations. But they, they have an inundation model and a data set. Uh, for different for different storms, and they just recently updated it to include Matthew and Florence. So once they did that, I wanted to take that data and look at you know geographically where this where this was happening. I also went to NC One Map to get the parcel data uh, and then the FEMA um, flood zone data. And so I'm only going to focus on the eastern the, the zone that covers the eastern branch of the North Carolina Department of Emergency Management. 
uh, it cuts off there. So I just want to let you know that 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 was just on purpose to, to kind of focus on our study area. So this is this is for Matthew. OK, and this uh, again, we can't get down to that resolution of parcels at this scale zoom way back here. But this is every parcel in this this area that was uh, that had flooding during Matthew, according to this flood lab data. And this is the flood extent uh, in centimeters. And so we see that Matthew was a was a wide ranging flood event for eastern North Carolina. We see if you can look at Lumberton towards the south, we know the problems that Lumberton had. Uh, it extended all the way up through Greenville. Um, this was really the, you know, when I lived in Greenville, this was the storm for me. You know, I was there after Floyd. I didn't see Floyd, but Matthew had some flooding I'd never seen before. And, and it was, it was, it was amazing. Uh, and then it goes all the way up into even the more rural parts of, of northeastern North Carolina. This now I went ahead and put on the, the flood zone map. Um, and I've, I've basically put blue down everywhere outside of the X zone, outside of that, that lowest um, flood hazard zone where it's you know 500 year flood or, or, or less risk. And so we see many of the properties are outside of this. And again, this, this points to the fact that using one measure of flooding, in this case, the FEMA flood maps, does not necessarily give you your, your risk level for, for flood, especially we're talking about pluvial flooding, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and I'm sure a lot of these that are that are on this map and not covered by the blue are caused by by rainfall. So um, then we go to Florence, and Florence um, we again a lot of that information in the news: Wilmington, New Bern, a lot of flooding, um, both surge related, but also a lot of that was uh, pluvial. Um, and but this one is was was more more restricted in terms of its, its extent. There wasn't as much flooding in Greenville and, and places northward. And I did the same thing, uh, put on the, the, the FEMA map to kind of um, hide the places that you, you should you know, know you're in, in a risky area. Uh, and then only seeing the, the locations where uh, we're in the X zone, we're in the, 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 the lower risk areas. And now this last one is both. Okay, so this was if a parcel was flooded both in Matthew and in Florence, it was, it was shown here. And then the depth is the combination, okay? So I went ahead and just added the two uh, to give you a sense of depth in centimeters. And so we see so much of Eastern North Carolina was affected by both of these storms. Um, again, especially towards the Southern portion of the study area. Um, and that's again, that's again the, uh, the, the putting the, um, the cover, the, the FEMA uh, cover on it. So here's some, here's some stats to, to draw from that. And uh, just a couple of quick, quick hits. A number of acres that are actually very similar between Matthew and Florence, but properties, um, Florence is, is higher. Uh, and that's not too surprising. We kind of think of Florence as being a little bit more of an urban flood event and, and, and Matthew maybe a little more of a rural flood event. Uh, so we're talking about all those properties in Wilmington, properties in other you know, more populated areas. Um, also the, um, uh, Kind of scary thing as far as number of properties, uh, about 40% or more uh, were outside of the, you know, the FEMA 100-year floodplain and we're in this more low risk zone X. Um, we also look at mean depth for what, for, I haven't really investigated this, but for whatever reason, the, the Matthew mean depth was higher than the Florence mean depth. And then in terms of um, part, total parcel value that was affected, that was flooded in some way, um, there was, you know, 25.9 billion in Matthew, 49.2 billion in Florence. And again, a lot of these properties were outside of that, you know, 100 year flood zone. They were out more in the 500 year or, or lower risk areas. And I haven't divided that out yet. I could probably do that with the data set I have, but I, I, I probably need to do that. And then the last two columns are on the, the both side of things. So, um, a little bit about this spatial compounding study. Um, we used uh, storm tide data from the USGS flood event viewer, 82 for Matthew, 123 were available for Florence. And to complement this, we included USGS stream gauges and 50 minute rain gauges. There's there are only 10 stream gauges that we're able to use um, and only two 50 minute uh, rain gauges to get at the evolution of the, of the event. How we determined spatial compounding was to calculate the time between landfall and peak surge 
and to look to see if the, the idea that is to see if that is um, if that number is going to be similar spatially, right? So if the if the peak surge was about the same time everywhere in, in regards to the landfall time, then that's going to make it more uh, make it more of a challenge for you know emergency managers and first responders to get to get out there. So we wanted to determine the differences between Matthew and Florence, and so we looked at this this delta T measure. Uh, First of all, using a KS test to see if there was a difference in those two populations between Matthew and Florence. And then spatial distributions um, of delta T using Moran's eye, and then spatial range of delta T using a semi-variogram analysis. So the results here, um, as far as the table one just gives the, uh, the peak surge value. Um, uh, so the, that's the mean is shown here standard deviation, the max and min, uh, the outliers. And then I looked at the pop, I looked at the district, the difference in the distributions of, of just the, 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 the peak surge. And um, that, that, did, that didn't read significance. Um, okay, so there was enough overlap there that uh, the, the P value is 0 0.088. But for this Delta T value, there was a huge difference. Okay, even though the mean was very similar, 0.4 days, versus 0.59 days. Again, that's the time of peak uh, surge to, um, versus landfall. The standard deviation was much larger, okay? So some stations reported their peak surge, um, you know, for, for Florence, uh, about uh, a day, um, I'm sorry, the max and min, I was looking at that. For Florence, some of the, the peak surges occurred seven days after landfall and others occurred a day before landfall, um, whereas that was not the case for, for Matthew looking at the max and min. And so that D, D statistic uh, was significant, uh, very significant. And then with the Moran's eye looking at clustering, uh, we also see that for Matthew, the p-value was very significant, the Florence was not. And what this is telling us for Moran's eye is whether these were significantly clustered in space. So Florence being having no significance suggests that it's more randomly distributed, not clustered, whereas Matthew is clustered in space. And that's, this will become more apparent as we look at some of the maps. The last thing we did was uh, calculate the semi-variogram range. So uh, this is essentially, this gamma um, number is essentially the difference between one st uh, storm surge value at one, one station versus a neighboring one. Okay, that's XI versus XJ. And we're looking at the Delta T, I should say again. We're, we're focused on this, this, this time uh, difference. And so when you, when you do this, basically creating the variance, uh, you can plot this uh, as a function of distance. And that's what's shown here. So this gamma um, for, for uh, Matthew at the top and for Florence at the bottom uh, is, is shown as a function of, of distance. And at some point, it reaches a, a plateau. They call it a sill in this, in this um, analysis. And that kind of gives you the range. Uh, and the range can be thought of, I think, and this is my, my conjecture, is it considered an area of effective hazard response? Because this is a, this is a point where this range is like saying that these, these delta Ts are very similar uh, within this range. And so what does that mean? That means everyone's having the same problem at the same time. It's how I kind of think of it, right? The surges are happening at the same, at the same time, which is going to make any kind of evacuation or, or rescue and recovery a little more challenging. And so there's a big difference in the range between Matthew and Florence. Matthew having 53,000 meters and Florence being 25,000 meters, so almost a doubling of that. And if we go to the map now, we see that focus on the, on the, the map on the right right now. It's, it becomes apparent just by looking at a, a color coding of, of these delta Ts. Again, these are, these are in terms of, um, of days. And so the whites are the very early surge events. And then you go in through the purples, which are around the time of landfall. Um, again, that's, that would be zero, would be at landfall. And then you get into post landfall. And so those are days uh, one, two, three, four, and, and so forth. And the big thing to see here is that you do have a, um, a, a more scattering of those delta Ts for the Florence event at the bottom. And, and they're all pretty much consistent in, in the Matthew event at the top. And that circle that you see in, inset into the map 
indicates that range value. If I was gonna, if I was gonna take that range value and, and put it as a circle, um, that's sort of that, that, again, that effective zone of, 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 um, of hazard response. You can kind of, again, I, I, can, I think you can kind of maybe think of it that way. And at least that's what we hypothesized in the paper. Um, and so what does that mean? It means that, again, like I said, Matthew, everything was happening at the same time, making it more difficult for uh, uh, hazard response. And even in this, even if uh, you ignore the northern part of the study area, if you look at the southern part along the southeastern coast, you see that there's more variation in Florence than there was uh, in Matthew. Uh, and then on the left is I decided to take some other variables since we know that these are both multivariate compounding events, multivariate CCWEs. Uh, we can see that in, in the measures of, of the, the, the discharge and in, in the measures of, of rainfall. So the, these. The green, uh, the, the middle and the bottom panels are, are two rainfall stations, the, the black and the, and the red, oh, sorry, the black and the green. The green being the Cape Fear Lock 1, which is the, on the map, it's the X that is covered by a square. The squares in the map are the USGS stream gauge observations. The circles are the, are the storm surge. Um, and then the, the X is the two rainfall um, measurements. And so in both of these cases, if you look at the, you know, where the, the, the bars are for the rainfall. Florence, it's, it's much more widespread. Again, it's, it's, it's looking at this in terms of that Delta T metric versus Matthew where it's all kind of clustered together. And then those X's indicate when minor flooding first happened at those 10 USGS stations, those 10 squares that you can see on the map. And <clears throat> again, a little bit wider um, impact in terms of when the flooding started uh, when, when the, these places reach minor flood stage for Florence than, than for Matthew. So the next part is, uh, hopefully I'll finish up in about 15 minutes and leave about 15 minutes for discussion. But this next part is my master's student, uh, Kelly's uh, thesis work. So I wanna give her um, um, credit for this. And she's, like I said, I think she's here on the call in case there's detailed questions that I can't help with. But, uh, but this is determining risk of CCW using the, the copula statistical measure that I mentioned earlier. Most of these copula uh, statistics are used for bivariate uh, hazards or um, bivariate extremes. But she is, is again, thinking that this is really a, a, a three-legged stool. We really need to understand the three together, pluvial, fluvial, and tidal flooding. So you take your variables and the way that she did it was she, she, she kind of anchored everything on precipitation. So looking at the maximum precipitation uh, by year and then determining what was the, the surge event, the surge value or the tide le level and the, um, the, the discharge amount within three days of that maximum precipitation. And the, and the, and the process is, is just kind of shown here. Basically, you, you fit that to marginal distributions. And then these copulas are basically functions that join or couple um, in this case, three in time independent variables, regardless of their univariate distribution. And then with that information, when she has that, she can create simulations. And so she, she created 10,000 simulations. And then that was able to produce return periods uh, because it's, it's very difficult to produce return periods when you only have 30, there's about 30 years, I think at the minimum. Um, she broke that out into three regions. I'll show that in a second, but I think for each reason, there's at least 30 of these kind of, um, uh, these, these 30 years of these variables. So here's where her, these were her study areas, uh, the uh, Pastoquank, uh, Pasquotank, uh, Pas sorry, uh, Roanoke River Basin, the Noose and White Oak River Basin, and the Cape Fear River Basin. And I'm just gonna focus on the central case study uh, for this, for the purposes of this talk. Uh, but you see the, <clears throat> The values for precipitation, tide, and stream discharge kind of compared against each other in this in this format on the top right. The locations and and of these of these are are shown in the in the map. We use the the, um, the Beaufort, North Carolina. I got to think Beaufort because now I'm in South Carolina. That's Beaufort, but the Beaufort, North Carolina uh, tide gauge station, the uh, Trenton, North Carolina precipitation uh, station, and then the Trent River. Um, uh, a stream gauge station. And you can get different distributions for these different variables. So for precipitation, it's the inverse Gaussian distribution that is the best model for this. The tide level, it's the generalized 
Pareto uh, distribution and the stream dis discharge, it's the Weibull distribution. This is uh, now the simulations, and this is uh, a little animation that she did to kind of now show it three dimensionally with these three levels, tide, stream discharge, and precipitation. So you can kind of turn it around and see how that works. And you see that they're, that they're related to each other, which is not surprising. These things happen in these kind of um, tropical systems. And so, um, yeah, so this, <clears throat> this is now the simulation. Part of it. And, and now we can now come up with um, return periods. And uh, so uh, we've done this for all 30 of our events to determine what the return periods would be in the and situation. The and situation means that all three of these are happening at the same time. Um, and so what you see on this uh, table here is precipitation what the value was uh, on, the, on the left. So that was the maximum precipitation for the year. The tide level, again, around that time, what it was, and the stream discharge around that time, what it was. This is the return periods for each of those individually, okay? So for precipitation, uh, tide, and stream. And then for the and, okay? So this is, the, this is basically the return period for the CCWE, okay? What is, a, what is the, the, the likelihood of us having one of these? Um, and I've highlighted in yellow the middle, the middle row, just to show you where that is on the, on the figure. Um, so again, there's um, precipitation, tide, and, and stream discharge <clears throat> related to each other. But the interesting thing is, and I think this is the thing that we have to maybe communicate to our stakeholders and to our emergency managers, is that this is not a, um, an additive game, okay? If you were to take those three values of return periods separately for precipitation, tide, and stream, in the first case, it's actually a good thing because it is um, lower, okay? Um, which means that uh, if we used all of those to, and added them up to come up with a value for return period for all three, we would have a lower number than the actual return period that was calculated, which is, which is good because it helps us to prepare, right? But this is the only case of those 30 some years, that was the only case where that happened. All other cases, the individual sums of those return periods were much larger than the return period of the CCWE. Um, so what does that mean? Well, that means that if we if we think that we look at these separately and just and just think of the risk as them of the, as them separate, and then we just kind of as the combined risk as those added, you're going to you're not going to be prepared for for that type of event. Um, so for example. If you added those up, you would get 284 for your return period when actually it's 215 years. So that's a that's a um, much you know much sooner than you would expect. And the bottom one, if you add those up, it's 30 years. And and again, it's actually would be more like 20 years when these things would happen. Okay, so that brings me to objective three, which is going to happen. We're so excited that this is this is going to happen. Uh, it was scheduled for. February of 2021, but again, because of COVID, we scrapped that. We asked for a new cost extension to continue this work and to have our workshop a year later, because this was only a two-year project originally. Um, and so we're, we're right now in the process of planning for our workshop, which is going to be held February 16th, 2022, again, on the campus of ECU. So um, we're going to include many of the people that were there in the first workshop, but also bring in new people um, that, are, that are working in the area. And so <clears throat> this is this is not this double diamond design process kind of shows you the, the relationship between those two workshops, but it's not an iterative process because we don't have the funds to kind of continue to do this. But really on the left, that was the first workshop, really, really understand the needs and really start to focus on what kind of research is necessary to do to get at these problems. And then the second workshop is on the right side of the diamond. OK, so this is on brainstorming ideas of, of ways forward. And, and thinking of prototypes. And this is where NIST is really gonna be helpful on this second workshop because they've, they've come up with some, some nice tools that I'll talk about in a second to help with, first of all, to getting, to getting priorities and ideas out from communities and also for some new tools to help with um, kind of understanding costs and understanding, um, again, with these compound hazards, what, what do we need to focus our attention on? So um, the kind of overarching question that we're going to be exploring on this workshop is what new or modified tools would make flood risk management more efficient 
and community is more resilient. So risk assessment, and we're going to kind of go back to, through the um, some of Kelly's work again, economic and health metrics, policy instruments, and then also funding streams. So what, what NIST is providing, uh, both leading up to this workshop, but also I think will be sort of something that they can uh, unveil in this workshop, is first of all, mental modeling. So this is something they're really interested in in, de in determining, you know, again, what are priorities and trying to kind of um, assess in sort of a quantitative way what people are thinking. And, and again, um, you know, basically, you know, procedures for reasoning, as, as the chart says, and, and, and looking at alternative models and, and, and that sort of thing. And the other thing is the, is the EDGES tool, which is really designed to support community level resilience planning. And this is a tool, so, um, Jennifer, who's, who's again from NIST on our project, kind of uh, equates this like TurboTax, where you, it's very simple. You put in your, your, um, your needs and you come up with some, some um, monetary uh, evaluation of it. So it assists in selecting those cost-effective community resilience projects. So I, I hope you can see by combining these two, that can be very powerful, right? Because you have the, the tool that gets to the economic in, in, uh, needs that are cost-effective, <clears throat> but then how do we transition from, again, all the flooding that we're seeing and, and making those priorities and, and kind of deciding what to put into this, into this um, EDGES tool. So, you know, we're really excited about the, the direction that's going. Okay, so to, to finish up here in the next few minutes, I've moved to South Carolina, so I'm trying to apply some of this here. One thing I've done was to volunteer my time <clears throat> to AGU Thri um, Thriving Earth Exchange, which I'm not sure if you're familiar with this, but this is basically a, a community of scientists that, that kind of give their time to help other uh, communities on the ground with some, with some issues. That they're having that are geoscience or geo, you know, in nature. So the one that I'm going to be helping with is very much similar to, to the problems that our, our Eastern North Carolina rural communities were, were having. So this is focused on the PD River Basin, but looking at mapping and, and, and attributing flood exposure and then its health consequences. So myself and another um, Scientists from, from Rutgers who's going to be doing more of the water quality sampling are going to be working on that. And then uh, the, the kind of cool thing is we still get to work with people on the ground, the communities where this is where this matters. And this is again giving back to the to the state. And and and, and the other thing in terms of Charleston is that uh, this group called Deltares is out of the Netherlands, is working on essentially compound flooding in the city and, and trying to model that. So they're they're looking at um, projections of storms that might come through and then what they were gonna bring in the events. And I know you can't read that, but under events, it talks about winds, it talks about surge, it talks about rainfall. And then the strategies, what strategies would be most useful to counteract these sort of compound events. And then this also has a very big community component because they're gonna invite community members to chime in on this, to, 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 to look at these scenarios. And I, what I'm doing here in this kind of this pre-planning phase is just to help with understanding whether the models that they're using make sense and, and to see if there's anything that we can do um, to make it more realistic, you know, in, our, in the context of Charleston. Because <clears throat> these guys are coming from the Netherlands, so they, they want that local input. And so that, that's kind of an exciting uh, venture that the city of Charleston has undertaken. And then we have these things in South Carolina. I've already kind of mentioned that with my opening uh, slide and um, you know heavy rainfall and high tides. This this area floods. We um, going back to last year. We also had a very bad king tide just a few weeks ago. It was a couple weeks ago actually here in Charleston. But the, the fall is the time for this. Fall is typically the time for for king tides, which may be one of the reasons why in the wall study there is this relationship between uh, surge and and uh, and these and these uh, you know strong precipitation events. But also at this time, um, only four days later, there was, a, there was a rain bomb which dropped over three inches in the downtown area. And these are pictures from our local newspaper to show the extent of flooding, to kind of give you an idea of the extent of flooding. But one, one idea is to further compound these with, with temperature. And this is another thing that's a serious issue with many urban areas in the, in, in the, in the South, Charleston and Norfolk, I'm sure has similar problems is that we have you know, high heat days and those can last into the fall season, right? It doesn't, unfortunately, summer doesn't end and then 
you know, it's not like the heat season hands off to the hurricane season says, here you go, right? There's a lot of overlap between these two. And so there's some concern about heat vulnerability in Charleston. And many underserved communities don't have the necessary air conditioning and, and, and don't have the amenities like trees and, and parks that might cool things off. And so <clears throat> we just had some really great heat studies that took place in Charleston. I don't have time to go into that but we're getting, gathering some data on heat now to go with the flooding. We've known about flooding for a long time, but the heat is, a, is another concern. And how does it compound? Um, well, because think about water contamination. As things heat up, there's more chance for bacteria growth, more chance for mold growth. And also what happens if the storm cuts out the power? Then even the people that have the air conditioning have to seek other sources for cooling because they can't, you know, they can't cool their homes anymore. So this is another, aspect or facet of that compounding. So in conclusion, then I'm going to um, end here by saying that uh, compound coastal water events are extremely impactful in eastern North Carolina, and assessing risk is challenging. And I think we've made some great strides on that uh, with this uh, trivariate com um, co copula uh, analysis that, that we did. And it's important to know that the sum does not equal the parts. Um, not only that, but we don't really understand fully, and this is being modeled right now um, by people at UNC and other places, but we really don't understand how these different water sources really intersect with each other on the ground. And we need really advanced hydro hydrology models, really advanced ocean models <clears throat> to, really, to really get at this. Fluvial flooding is, is really the unexpected flood source. And I think you probably would all agree with that as well. And it's also being seen as becoming more frequent and more damaging with time. And due to the recent hurricanes, Florence, Matthew, and now Dorian, which, which occurred, um, hazard management practitioners in Eastern North Carolina are very aware of temporal compounding. That's probably the most important thing on their minds right now. And that has a huge impact on economics and health. All right, again, as that quote said, just as they're rebuilding from one storm, another storm comes. So all that money they've invested in rebuilding is now lost. Also with health, mental health. Storm after storm, I think, is wearing on people in eastern North Carolina. And I think, I think we're trying to investigate that. We're looking at some, some health data to, to investigate that. But we haven't come across <clears throat> a smoking gun there. But. And then finally, Matthew and Florence, the two that, um, again, most recent and, and most impactful storms in eastern North Carolina, very similar flood extents. Florence flooded more properties, but Matthew had a, a greater spatially average uh, greater average spatial flood depth. And then um, Matthew, I, I kind of think of this now after going through this, is really Matthew was more of a rural, spatially compounded CCWE versus Florence, which is much more targeted uh, to some of the urban areas and, and kind of went along the coast. Part of that was due to the, the tracks and, and of these two storms, which were very different, and, and also due to the, uh, the speed as well. But um, but you know we're hoping that that might be might be useful to understand uh, this kind of spatial compounding this way uh, in the future. So, um, anyways, I think I'm going to end there and open it up for any questions. Thanks, Tom. Oh, thanks, Scott. I'll just mute everybody to hold the applause here. <laughs> so, <laughs> we do have a few minutes for some questions. I already see there's there's a there's a clap. Um, I already do, do see a couple questions. So. Um, maybe I'll, I'll take uh, the role of asking a few, hopefully I'll squeeze one of mine in. Uh, one of them is from Kelly about, um, you know, modern building codes. And um, I think she's getting at the issues uh, along like the rivers in Charleston. Actually, we've got this also here where there's marshes and um, there's no accommodation space uh, left for marshes uh, with sea level rise to, um, help buffer the floodwaters. Um, so have you um, come across uh, in this project uh, issues of like people confronting building codes and revising them or any other strategies to uh, kind of adapt given the, the rising water and compound floodedness? Yeah, and, uh, and I'll talk more to, on Charleston on that one because I think it's probably more applicable there than in, in rural North Carolina, but um, you might know this, Tom, but the, the Dutch Dialogues came through um, mm -hmm. Charleston, and they're all about living with the water and, and doing those kind of natural solutions to, to better prepare ourselves. 
So this is in contrast to, for example, the U US Army Corps of Engineers, which is thinking about a, a seawall that's gonna go around the peninsula and try to prevent those, those big storm surge events from happening. But, and, 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 and then also Charleston just released a climate action plan. And part of that is buildings and, and sort of trying to position new buildings, new construction in with, you know, trying to be more sustainable with, with climate change. But this is a serious issue for Charleston. Um, you know, it's, it, we have very limited real estate for development and uh, the development pressures are huge. Um, especially again, as you go up the Ashley and go up the Cooper River, um, you know, in, that, in those directions where then fluvial flooding is gonna be, become more, more of an issue. Um, but yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't really have a, a, a good solution for that. I mean, I think a lot of eyes are on it right now. And, um, you know, I think, I think we need it. We, we could definitely do more. The, the Charleston Peninsula, you know, it's, um, if you look at it decades ago, before all the construction happened, you'll see all of the, the marshes and the little rivers and inlets. And now, now we're down to just a very few uh, marshes on the actual peninsula itself. Um, so um, yeah, I guess that's the best answer I can have for that, that question, but thank you. Yeah, that's from Kelly. Um, it's getting at the coastal squeeze concept of diminished space. In, you know, I just had a paper in out and we actually looked at Charleston and uh, the ports. There's a new uh, marine terminal uh, up the east side of, I think, at the, the Cooper, and they elevated it. It's a brand new, uh, huge, huge port terminal. So there's kind of an adaptation going on, uh, whether you want to call it that or not. Um, then we have a question from uh, Kate Boycourt from uh, EDF. And uh, Thoughts about your uh, best practices on modeling uh, compound flooding. Uh, you mentioned UNC or some others, um, you know, to get at um, how do you inform and get better kind of cost benefits of, of doing more protection, uh, getting better at the flood models. Right. So I guess, it, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things where we have these, this modeling that I think is, it, it is a challenge uh, to, to get at this. Um, we, we didn't do this for this study. Now that wasn't, ours was, was, was all statistical. Um, but I think the important thing is, is awareness a lot in a lot of times is that uh, trying to uh, help people understand that this is a problem that we are working on. We're trying to find better Better, better models to, to, to kind of give us a better sense of risk. You know, the, 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 the disadvantage of what Kelly did and, and, and the idea of using these, the statistical approach is that we only have a few stations that, uh, that we can use to, to, to help us come up with these, these metrics. And so if, if the modeling can catch up and we can have confidence in our models about the compounding that's going on, then we, I think we can do a lot. We can make some really great strides in terms of um, you know the, these 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 decisions, um, and and as far as the the kind of related to that, going back to the edges and mental modeling, the idea there is just again to to, to, to situate compound flooding in the, in the thought process in the decision making process, and and to think you know wh why go over after this one adaptation solution that might be great for fluvial, but doesn't have any you know help with um, uh, the, the the pluvial flooding or the or the storm surge, so trying to come up with solutions that might, you know, uh, be directed at the entire CCWE itself, I think is is something that 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 definitely could could happen. Um, okay. Again, thinking of the seawall, right? The seawall seawall is great for stopping a uh, uh, storm surge. Not so great if you've got a lot of of rainfall in the peninsula. So in addition to the seawall, they have to have pumps to pump out the the rainwater that will get trapped yeah. behind that behind the yeah. wall, so. Yeah, um, City of Virginia Beach just passed uh, quite overwhelmingly a referendum to do uh, hundreds of million millions of dollars in largely stormwater uh, projects for resilience. And there's a question from Speaker Pollard um, with Williams Mullen about, have you looked at that um, aspects around Charleston? Um, is stormwater, ditches, I mean, uh, like, I think you just alluded to this getting when you get to such low elevations uh, with tidal uh, flood areas, you you lose your gravity head and you you really have to uh, look turn to pumps or retreat. 
Yeah, that, exactly. That's something that's uh, clearly I'm glad happening you mentioned there. Ditches. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned ditches because that's something that uh, came up a lot from our from our uh, focus groups in Eastern North Carolina. And they said that, you know, um, for example, um, Tyrell County has a lot of national forest. And, you know, if that falls down and, and, and then clogs up the ditches, you know, or gets washed into the ditches um, over time, you know, they're not responsible for that. So that, that goes at the kind of the, the conflicts and jurisdiction sometimes too uh, around that. But that did come across. And, and I'm not sure, I'm not 100% convinced that's going to help uh, necessarily. And, you know, considering what, what, you know, what has to be done, but, um, but yeah, that, that was something that, that was mentioned quite a few times in our, in our focus group. Yeah. We have very few, uh, what you call backflow preventers around here. So, you know, this, we had this last weekend, a second of week or two, three weeks in a row, uh, Hampton Boulevard in front of ODU is flooded. So, wow, you know, yeah. um, Let's see, anybody else in the uh, gallery have a question? Yeah, Tom. This hey, is, Jim, uh, go ahead. Yeah. Um, I remember years ago they were talking about Atlanta, the heat signature from Atlanta causing more frequent storms, uh, downdrift from to, to the east of Atlanta. I was wondering if there's any way to get at that problem of, of uh, you know, large, large areas that are uh, causing heating, you know, general heating to uh, um, increase, increase fluvial flooding uh, to down, downdrift communities. Yeah, that's, that's correct. There was a couple of studies in Atlanta and actually other places. Um, uh, I think Marshall Shepard, you might know him, Tom, that was involved in some of that, but um, uh, yeah, and that, that's actually, if you think about it, that is another aspect of compound flooding, right? Or compound hazards, right? Because you have the heat, and in, in my example, I was talking about more localized heating, and then and then and then that that coming after the storm events. But the heating itself, uh, especially in urban settings, can lead to precipitation that forms and moves downwind, and, and in fact, may not even hit the urban area itself, but maybe the surrounding rural communities. Um, but yeah, I mean that's, that's you know how how do we how do we get around that? I have to you know. Think about you know what what do we do, um, you know again what all we can do is try to mitigate these things and uh, I think there is a cascading uh, positive impact that can happen. So if we can plant more trees or or more parks in urban areas, then maybe we can alleviate the pluvial flooding issue a little bit. Here's your uh, your tree canopy uh, answer, Jim. I know you're heading yes. that way. <laughs> um, well, that's hey, part Scott, of it. And the other thing is uh, all these parking areas that have no trees. That I'd like to see them put wow. solar arrays on parking areas, but that's expensive. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, especially black rooftops with solar. Hey, Scott, I wish, your, I wish your, your study had just gone like 20 miles north. <laughs> and you live in Hampton Roads. Um, These darn state boundaries get in the way. You know, Florence, we had clear skies and a mass evacuation order. Um, but then, um, you know, some of these some of these storms are super track sensitive, or you get training heavy bands of rainfall. Um, so really good spatial analysis. But my 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 question would be, what uh, what about the precursor rainfall events? Like in Matthew we had about 13 inches and uh, in Chesapeake flooded and parts of Virginia Beach, um, straight rainfall, but it was extremely high soil moisture, um, kind of like a setup like uh, Hurricane Floyd had, where you had prior storms and just generally rainy period. Um, do you think that's kind of um, accounted or something yet more to look at? Yeah, so that, that is one of those, that's one of the typologies, right, is, is the preconditioned compound event, where one event sets the stage for the other, for the other uh, to be a hazard, where it might not have been a hazard otherwise. Um, but yeah, and so um, that's definitely something to, to look at, for sure, um, on, on these things. I, um, uh, I haven't really focused on that much myself, but, uh, but it is something people are looking at. They, they've identified that as, as, as one of those typologies of compound hazards, for sure. Yeah. Anybody else? Final call. 
Um, go here. Uh, I do want to put a plug in for uh, next week. Uh, Ata Swanda from UNC Wilmington uh, is going to talk about tidal effects in coastal circulation models, actually unresolved tidal effects. And uh, could be something, uh, a piece of the puzzle yet further, Scott. Um, <laughs> thanks again. Uh, been great to see you and uh, really interesting research. I, I think it strikes a chord with a lot of us and um, stay sharp. I, I think I can salute you, <laughs> sir. And thanks everyone for coming. Um, I'll catch up with you again soon, Scott. Okay, sounds good, Tom. Thank you. Have a good week. Maybe next week thanks. in Greenville. Right. That's right. Thank you very much. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye. Yeah, thanks, Eileen. Yeah, bye-bye, everyone.